السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله حمدا كثيرا طيبا مباركا فيه مباركا عليه كما يحب ربنا ويرضى كما ينبغي لجلال وجهه وعظيم سلطانه الصلاة والسلام على أسعد خلقه وخاتم رسله محمد صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه والتابعين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين ثم أما بعد It is always a pleasure and an honor to be in the company of our Ustaz Prof. Kamali and our dear brother uh, Dr. Azam and all the brilliant minds and souls and hearts of IAIS uh, I am looking forward to cooperation with IAIS in a number of ways. The field of thought and research is a, is a crucial field for the Muslim Ummah at this time. And I would be honored, inshallah, to cooperate in a number of ways. Let me start uh, in the time allowed uh, to talk about the future of Maqasid al-Sharia, which to me is a very long story and very big topic that requires uh, an extended uh, discussion but in the time inshallah that we have um, I let me start by the concept of tajdeed the renewal that every living thing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had judged in his sunan in his universal laws that every living thing has to renew itself. And if the creature that is alive does not renew itself, it dies. Uh, the human body, if it doesn't change cells, it dies. And the earth, if it doesn't go through cycles of warm and, and cold, it dies. And this is a sunnah. This is a universal law that we cannot go against. In fact, one of the maqasid al-shari'a that I talked about is maqsudu muraat al-sunan al-ilahiyya, the objective of the harmony with the universal laws. This is an objective in the sharia that anything that we do should be in harmony with the bigger laws that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the universe with. The ummah of Islam is an alive entity, is an entity, is something that has a spirit and is something that if we do not renew is going to die. If we do not renew how the ummah thinks and how the ummah approaches issues, the ummah will die. Islam is in Allah's um, protection and Islam will never die. The belief in Allah, there will always be people who believe in Allah and we should not be concerned about Islam but we should be concerned about the Ummah because this Ummah has to renew itself because now we live in a totally different planet from the planet that even our parents lived in and the renewal is necessary for us to be able to deal with the situation that we're living in, the complex world that we are in today, and to survive as an ummah. Everybody agrees that we are at a low point as an ummah, and that we are, uh, inshallah, hopefully rising towards something better, a better existence as an ummah. And this renewal is necessary. To me, Maqasid al-Sharia is one of the main tools for this renewal. One of the necessary um, vehicles that could carry the renewal of the Ummah in order for us to have a renewed thought. And the renewed thought, as I mentioned, is very important so that the Islamic thought does not die. And the Islamic uh, spirit does not die. And why is Maqasid al-Sharia that important? To me, because it comes from within, not from without. So many calls are done to renew Islam and to reinterpret Islam and to look at Islam in a different way that comes from outside Islam, not from within Islam. From outside Islam in a number of ways, not just from outside Islam as in Western civilization and Western philosophy, in fact, 
this is the least of our worries, really. The most of our worries is what comes from outside Islam, from within the Muslim Ummah, that is destroying Islam and its thought. What comes from within the Muslim Ummah that are the sicknesses, the diseases that we are suffering from as an Ummah that is actually attacking us from within. Uh, and it is actually, the, these are ideas that are from without, not from within. We have what we can call economism attacking Islam. The economy being the new idol, the new ta'ut that everybody is worshipping these days. And in the name of economy, we are talking about development and progress and so forth. And these become the methodology and the basis and the philosophy by which we deal with Islam. So when we deal with Islamic banking, and our Prof. Kamali mentioned that, if growth and progress and so forth is going to be our basis and our philosophy, then we will have an Islamic banking that is not really Islamic, that is serving the wider agenda of monopoly, the wider agenda of the incredible uh, wealth gap that we see in this world. Now we're hearing about people whose wealth is in the trillions and the hundreds of trillions. And we are aware of 90% of the people in this world who are struggling just to eat and just to have a medicine if they get sick and so forth. That wealth gap cannot be justified from an Islamic point of view, but it is justified through a methodology that justifies uh, the current economic structure and puts the Islamic economic um, endeavors sometimes as, um, if you wish, parasites uh, on, on the big, big mammal of the, 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 the current uh, economy. We cannot justify the Islamic thought through nationalism. That is one methodology that is coming from outside Islam that is now becoming mainstream in Islam. Islamic movements are fighting for national um, you know, agendas these days. And the Arab youth, for example, in the Islamic movements are dying for the sake of their, of the, of their nations and their national identities and so forth. The Islamic agenda even of the Islamic movements have been totally hijacked by nationalism and by working towards governments that are structures of hegemony, not structures that are oriented for the interest of the people. And it, it's becoming a problem because that kind of thought is coming from outside Islam. And yes, you could love your country and you love your people and all of that and the Prophet ﷺ loved uh, Mecca, etc. But that is not the nationalism we're talking about. We're talking about Asabiya. We're talking about an extreme nationalism that puts the goals of the nation above the goals of Islam and the interest of the people above what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has asked us to, to achieve. Um, we have therefore in the name of nationalism, a politicization of, of Islam and Islamic thought, and including Maqasid al-Sharia. Maqasid al-Sharia has been highly politicized uh, in, in the very narrow sense, not in the sense that Islam has nothing to do with politics. Of course, Islam has everything to do with politics. But Islam is not supposed to be used for the narrow political agenda of anybody, left or right, um, conservative or liberal in the political sense. Islam is not supposed to be used and the maqasid al-sharia being an integral part of Islam as I will explain is not supposed to be taken as a means to achieve narrow and selfish ends that are the political ends in the name of nationalism and so forth. Uh, we have a problem with extremist ideas. 
that are also political ideas. Anyway, now we are, we are knowing more and more in the public that the extremist ideas that especially emerged from the Arab world are all political agendas that are, you know, supported by people with particular agendas. But the problem is that even though extremism is being uh, fought against in the Arab world, along with a lot of Islamic, um, you know, parts of Islam anyway, it is alive and thriving everywhere in the world because of the investment that was put in extremism and literalism and, you know, all the, the, the Salafi movements and so forth. Not saying that every Salafi approach is not Islamic, but a lot of what we see in today's world in the name of Salafism is actually an agenda that serves very particular political ends, especially in the Arab world. And that is a danger that comes from outside Islam, not from within Islam. This is not depending on what Islam is saying. This is depending on the interests of, of some uh, particular groups. And that is a problem. In the name of Maqasid al-Sharia, some of the extremist ideas are being justified. And in the name of Maqasid al-Sharia, some of these political nationalist ideas are justified. Uh, and in the name of Maqasid al-Sharia, some of the monopolist and the material worshipping positivist kind of approach is, is justified. And finally, we have a problem with what we can call the other end of extremism, which some people call liberalism, some people call secularism, regardless of the names. It is actually looseness in dealing with Islam and what Islam is asking us to abide by. People who would like to people who would like to believe in some of the book and give up some. People who would like to, uh, in the name of Maqasid al-Sharia, and I've seen this with my own eyes, justifies uh, gay marriage, justifies, uh, you know, riba, usury, justifies uh, things that are not only Islam, in every religion is haram and is not allowed and so forth. And, and therefore, this is also another enemy from outside Islam that is claiming to be renewing Islam, but it's not. It is actually destroying Islam. So how can we renew Islam in order for Islamic thought? Of course, I mean, I explained that in order for Muslims to live Islam in today's world in a meaningful way, in a constructive way, in order for Muslims to contribute to today's life without the Islamic thought and the Islamic agenda being hijacked by anybody with any agenda other than the Islamic agenda. What is the Islamic agenda? We can ask. And therefore, how can we read Maqasid al-Sharia? The Islamic agenda is the Quranic agenda. And Maqasid al-Sharia cannot be but based on the Quran, based on the Al-Wahi, based on the revelation. And of course, the Quran is explained by the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. وَنَزَّلْنَا إِلَيْكَ الذِّكْرَ وَأَنزَلْنَا إِلَيْكَ الذِّكْرَ تُبَيْنَا النَّاسِ مَا نُزِّلَ إِلَيْهِمْ وَلَعَلَّهُمْ يَتَّقُونَ So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is يُبَيِّن is a bayan, is an illustration. Therefore, the Quran and the Sunnah that is illustrating the Quran, that is Islam, that is the core of Islam. And Maqasid al-Sharia, if it is not based on the Quran and Sunnah in that sense, and if it is not applied to serve the Maqasid of the Quran and Sunnah, then it is not genuine and it is not acceptable, even if it's called Maqasid al-Sharia. So in the name of justice, if we apply justice in a way that defeats the purposes of the Quran and Sunnah, in the name of justice, we call for the application of hudud, let's say. But we call for an application of hudud that is unfair and unjust. And that is against the Quran and Sunnah. We call for the, uh, you know, the cutting of the hand 
of, of the poor person who steals a loaf of bread. And we are not, you know, balancing that as the Prophet وسلم, with the cutting of the hand of a prince uh, that steals, as the Prophet وسلم, mentioned. إنه كان من كان قبلكم إذا أهلك من كان قبلكم إنهم كانوا إذا سرق فيهم الشريف تركوه وإذا سرق فيهم الضعيف أقاموا عليه الحد The had cannot be just taken out of context and out of the maqasid of the had in the Quran and the Sunnah So the Prophet said it was the people before you were destroyed when if the rich person or the powerful person steals they don't uh, apply the punishment and if the poor person steals, then they apply the punishment. So I don't mind if you want to, to cut the thief's hand or cut the thief's neck. But if you have to do that, you have to cut the neck of everybody, not just the poor person who steals a loaf of bread. And Omar radiallahu anhu, when he was faced by a case where a slave was forced to steal in order to eat, he told his masters, the two masters who owned that slave in the time of Omar, he told them, if he steals again, I will cut your hands, not his hands. Because you made him steal. You put him into hunger, he said. Anhu. And this is the fiqh of the maqasid, of the hudud, that we need to apply the hudud in, in its framework, not in the framework of uh, an idea that is not Islamic in that sense. Now, based on the Quran and Sunnah, we have to uh, rebuild our fiqh. And as I mentioned, this is a long story, but I will try to give highlights. Our fiqh, my brothers and sisters, requires renewal. Uh, and we can renew in what we can call fiqh al maqasid the fiqh of the objectives. How is that fiqh different from the fiqh we know? Number one, the fiqh we know is legalistic. It's talking about particular rules uh, that apply mostly in the legal field, apply mostly in the court, or in the area of ibadat. So if you open a book of fiqh, most of the book will teach you how to read, how to pray, how to fast, how to do hajj, and so, and so forth, issues of zakah. And then after that, you will find a few chapters on jihad and a few chapters on the financial dealings and so forth. Our fiqh in that sense requires major renewal because we do not have fiqh for the aspects of life that we deal with today. We do not have fiqh for the economics of today other than the Islamic financing part, which is by the way, about 80%, 85% of what is written on Maqasid al-Sharia in the English language is written on the Islamic finances. And written mostly in a hila way, in a trick, legal trick, justifying the system. Not trying to change the system or renew it or better it. And, and therefore, when we uh, deal with the, the, the Maqasid, uh, we have to go back to the original source, to, to the Qur'an. Uh, now, um, the, the, that going back to the Qur'an for the fiqh will require the expansion of fiqh, as I mentioned, and this is not only in the area of finances. We do not have a fiqh for arts and entertainment and artistic expression. Um, our youth have been um, basically swallowed by the entertainment business and everything that it offers and, and the kind of expressions that are given to them to express morality, to express the truth in the world. And we do not have a fiqh by which we can face that. We have some Islamic movies and Islamic nasheeds and songs and so on. But everybody would agree with me, even though I love them very much, everybody would agree with me that they are very basic. And they do not rise to the level of entertainment, the highly entertainment industry, uh, entertaining industry that we have, that is engulfing our youth. Uh, with the games, we do not have an Islamic game 
that really teaches the Islamic morality. Uh, we, we do not have uh, this wealth of movies that are changing the youth's minds and so forth. We need a fiqh for that. And the fiqh for that cannot just be whether it's haram or halal to listen to music and to draw an animal. And th these are silly issues that we have to leave in the past. And we have to go beyond that into dealing with the fiqh of entertainment as we need today. The fiqh of the environment is actually absent from our fiqh. And that is not a fault of our scholars from the past. They did their best in their environments. But in today's environment, we have an environmental crisis that we are heading towards as humanity. And Muslims are not contributing towards that, really. Uh, the only way we can contribute towards that is through a, a maqasid approach to the environmental studies. I attended the pre-sessions of this uh, Paris um, summit about the environment. It happened a couple of years ago. Uh, yeah, th that pre-session was in Rome that I attended. And I didn't see any Islamic contribution, really, on the state's levels or on the scholarship level. Uh, we didn't have any Islamic contribution to the solution of the crisis of the environment. We are heading towards a, 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 an environmental um, meltdown of the earth, and we don't have a fiqh that deals with that. Uh, I was very happy to see in Indonesia a, a group in the Muhammadiyah dealing with the fiqh of water, fiqh al and they produced a good volume on that. That is a renewal in the name of the maqasid, the higher objectives of Islam when it comes to water, that is very welcome and very needed. How can we approach the environmental issues from an Islamic point of view, a maqasid uh, point of view? When we deal with fatwa, even in the traditional sense, fatwa means to go back to the old books in order to look for a solution for the problems of today. And that is not enough. And that will make fiqh literally die from the life of the people. People don't care to ask about fiqh anymore. People, I mean, the majority of Muslims. Uh, why? Because it doesn't really fulfill the needs. It doesn't fulfill their needs of what is halal and haram when it comes to fatwa. Uh, a major one is the family law in Islam. Family law is highly outdated. And there is a number of major changes that happened in the family structure and in the economics of the family and in the societies that require a response from a fiqhi perspective. How do we deal with the issues of property in a family now? Uh, for example, now that women contribute as much as men to the property of the family, do we consider the property of the family the man's as it is in the previous fiqh, or do we redefine property in terms of family from a fiqh perspective, looking at the maqasid, and therefore considering this to be shared properly, uh, property from a, from a, uh, from a legal perspective? Um, how, how do we deal with the issue of khula, or women asking for divorce in Islam? If we go back to the previous fiqh in any madhab, and we take al khula, we will see that it does not fulfill what we could consider basic rights for women today. And our poor sisters, because we do not give them an Islamic solution, they go back to the Sidao or they go back to any uh, politically motivated international thing in order for them to get some of their rights. But if we reject the Sidao, what alternative do we offer? Uh, it, in, in, instead of the Sida, uh, if we are going to reject uh, given equal rights in the, in the liberal sense, what alternative are we going to, to give? We need to formulate a fiqh that fulfills the needs of today. And I gave a couple examples. Um, when it comes to issues of politics and polity and so on, Islam is not far from, from politics. But Islam in politics is morality in politics. Islam in politics is not just a, you know, an election kind of uh, tool. 
Islam in politics is how to bring morality in politics. We don't have contemporary theories for that. We have all theories in which the scholars have talked about the siyasa sharia and how to bring Islam into the issue of the siyasa in that sense. But we really do not have a theory that is going to be a political theory. The theories that we have so far that the Islamic movements had advanced are theories for an Islamic state in the national sense. And there is so much contradiction in these theories and they are not holding water really. Uh, because how can you reconcile the Islamic approach with a national state? Uh, are we going to talk about nation building, which is what I understand is, is what Islam is, is approaching? Or are we going to talk, to talk about hijacking the state and oppressing the non-Muslims in the state? Is this, does this make any sense from an Islamic point of view? Would the Prophet ﷺ or his companions do that? And so forth. We need a whole theory. And other than the field of siyasa in the politics sense, we need a whole field of siyasa in the policy sense. I was very happy to see IAIS hosting policy and Maqasid al-Sharia uh, conference. I, I read the proceedings out there. And I thought that we need to develop that further because policy sciences are very complex sciences and they need an Islamic alternative. We do have uh, something to offer uh, that, that field in order for policy to be directed towards the people according to Islam. Let me get a little bit into the how question. How can we do that? To read the maqasid of the Quran and the Sunnah. Do we go back to the five or six maqasid? I think the five or six maqasid are one side of the maqasid of the Quran and Sunnah. And uh, they do not fulfill the intellectual requirements uh, of all that I mentioned of the new fiqh. Uh, I think we need to consider them as one of the dimensions, the dimension of darurat, hajiyat, tahsiniyat, and so forth, hifduddin, wal nafs, wal aql, wal mal, wal ard, and all of this, as I assume uh, many of you would know. But there are many other dimensions of the Quran that are related to these fields that I am talking about. How can we build these dimensions? A number of tools. One of them is concepts. We need to go back to the Quran and see what are the concepts that the Quran made as objectives in the different fields. And from these concepts, we work out the relationship between the Quranic ideals and the reality. So to go back and to look at our Prophet mentioned Al-Uqud, uh, Al-Kitabah, the concepts that have to do with law, with dealings uh, in, in, the, in the civil sense, and how the Al-Uqud become not just a concept but a theory uh, in Islam, how this Nadariyatul Aqd become a basis for our dealings with Uqud, but in a sense that is faithful to the objectives of the Qur'an. How a shura becomes a, not just a concept, a mafhum, but a nadariya, a theory. How can we build around the theory of shura in order to renew and reform and reconstruct our political theories that we propose in the name of Islam around the concepts uh, of shura, uh, the concept of justice, al-adl. You go back to the Quran and read al-adl versus at tughyan or at taghut uh, so that not in the name of Adl we propose tughyan or istibdad or tyranny. No, in the name of Adl we know very well that the Quran defined uh, tyranny in a certain ways and we need to avoid these tyrannical ways in order to achieve justice uh, in, in, in Islam. Uh, concepts of the Quran form a web um, of meanings that actually build a whole worldview that are different from the worldview that we uh, gain from the past and the worldview that we borrow from others. And that worldview will allow Muslims to move beyond uh, the, the current obstacles and the apologism and so forth and the misuse of maqasid into a more genuine use of the maqasid. 
Um, the, the definition of the concepts is very important, and that is one of the objectives of the Quran. Number two, the definition of a sunan, the universal laws. How can we understand a sunan from a Quranic perspective, and how these sunan could be a part of our strategic thinking? Because without thinking in the bigger cycles, our strategies will be hijacked by other people's strategies and other agendas that are un-Islamic. But in order to get the Islamic right angle when it comes to strategies, we need to look at a sunan for the Quran. And Al Quran talked about a sunan in many ways, direct and indirect. I wouldn't have time to elaborate on the concepts and the universal laws, the mafahim was sunan. But the Quran talked about sunan in many ways. The sunan that are related to the creation of the human, and therefore this has to do with the fitrah. Economy defines the human in a certain way that is and sometimes against the fitrah. Psychology defines humans in a certain way that sometimes are against the fitrah. Every science that has to deal with humans defines humans in a way that is against the sunan that Allah created for us as a fitrah. And not only fitrah of the individual, but the fitrah of the society. The society as a whole has a spirit and has dynamics in terms of its birth and its peak and its demise. Uh, Ibn Khaldun touched on this in his great theories that also needs update. And these sunan are maqsuda. They are objectives in, order, in, in their own right. And the dirasa of the sunan, the, the study of the universal laws, should be one of the maqasid themes uh, of study so that our objectives are in line with the universal laws. We also need, number three, if I may, al-qiyam. We need the values that the Quran propagates. We have a battle of values these days between the Islamic values and other values that are trying to hijack the Islamic agendas. And it is very important to go back to the Quran to look for what has a value, what is good. The good old question of the Greeks and of everybody, how do you define good? You define that in the Quran according to Al-Uswa, the example. Good in the Quran is not defined rationally in a Kantian way, and it's not defined uh, in, in the virtue sense of, the, uh, of any of these philosophical schools. And I think any, any rational approach to the define of values is going to end up in a relativistic kind of dilemma that causes the deconstruction of that value. But if you look at the al-uswa, at the example, the uswa of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, فَتْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولَ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنًا That is how we can define value without deviating with the value to un-Islamic values. Uh, the, the values are supposed to be taken from the Qur'an and they are supposed to be objectives for us. Uh, there is an objective for every organization to achieve certain values. And if we take these values and bring them as part of the strategy, strategy making of Islamic thinking and Islamic institutions and organizations, we should be able to be moving towards a, a, a better uh, and more authentic and more Islamic way. And the fifth item is al-ahkam or the rules. So far, we focus only on the rules, but the rules without the concepts are going to lead us astray because we apply the rules to the wrong concepts. We have concepts that are foreign to the spirit of Islam and the objectives of Islam, and we try to apply the rules of Islam within these concepts in order to justify them, the foreign concepts, I mean. And therefore, the rules and the concepts are coupled, uh, but they have to both be Quranic. And from the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ explaining the Quran, uh, the rules have to be tied to the Sunan, to the universal laws. You cannot apply the rules in an empty vacuum without looking at the bigger cycles that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala created the universe with, 
and created our fitra with. The rules have to be applied to the values, al qiyam And it is not possible to apply the rules of Islam without the values of Islam. Otherwise, again, you come up with outcomes that are against the values uh, of, of Islam. And the maqasid. And, and the, those five elements, to me, are the future of research in maqasid al-shari'ah and the future of implementation of this research in the Muslim reality. Uh, the future is to look back to the Quran and Sunnah and understand the Sunnah in the context of the Quran, which is another story, but very important. And from that, we build the right concepts, the right values, the right frameworks uh, within the universal laws uh, and the, the right rules that govern our uh, ethical behavior in order for us to rebuild al-fiqh in that sense, a wider fiqh that goes beyond the, our understanding of the, the fiqh in a traditional way into a fiqh that deals with every aspect of life of today. And these would become kind of um, fundamentals of that fiqh. Uh, usul al-fiqh so far dealt with the tools of derivation rather than the, the pillars of, of the world view. But usul al-fiqh, and if you read the Shatabi well, his understanding of usul al-fiqh was usul al-millah, were, were the pillars of Islam. And based on the pillars of Islam, we can build uh, the, the renewal, or the restructuring of the Islamic thought in these ideas, in, in these areas of fiqh that are supposed to take us forward. The um, character of the, the new fiqh uh, is going to be different from the current uh, status quo, whether of fiqh or of Islamic thought in general, and therefore will take a lot of resistance uh, from uh, people who would like to see monotony in the Islamic thought, but without renewal at the level of usul, not usul al-aqidah, but usul al-fiqh the fundamentals and the pillars and the basic theories of fiqh in that sense to include the research in the concepts and values and universal laws and, uh, and, and, and the objectives of course and maqasid and the rules then we are not moving forward we are actually trying to reinterpret the past for the present and because the present is very different the interpretation of the past in the present is not going to fulfill the objectives that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from us when we deal with the present. Uh, it's, um, it's a long story and I just wanted to highlight uh, several aspects of that renewal, that future of Maqasd al-Sharia research that, that I think um, I could have given you a survey on Maqasd al-Sharia and the languages that deals with maqasid and the different institutions around the world uh, and so forth. I gave that in, in other contexts. You might find it on my social media if you're interested uh, as an academic survey. But I thought that IAIS uh, deserves a discussion or I deserve from IAIS a discussion uh, towards the future, towards a new fiqh and a new usul in that sense. And in an academic setting like that, this is the place to discuss that. Uh, how can we rebuild our fiqh in order for it to be comprehensive and to be contemporary and to be ethical and to be true to the original objectives of Islam, the objectives that are there in the Quran and Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu without any apologism, without a misuse of these sources in order to justify worldly selfish agendas. Uh, we work towards the truth and towards what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from us uh, in this world. Uh, thank you very much for listening to this and inshallah welcoming any questions and comments inshallah. Jazakumullah khair. As-salamu alaykum.